Welcome back, everyone. Today, we are going to be uh, doing experiment number eight. Experiment number eight is actually two distinct experiments. If you're sitting at a table with this setup, you are going to be doing the famous E over M experiment. If you're sitting at a table with this uh, different equipment, an oscilloscope and a function generator, you are, you're going to be doing a, a, a very different experiment. It's an experiment on um, uh, electromagnetic induction. Something that um, uh, is also very important to us because um, if it wasn't for electromagnetic induction, we wouldn't be able to uh, enjoy the life that we have with the electronic um, and electrical equipment that we use uh, in our everyday lives. Okay, I, I will first describe um, this um, part of the experiment. This setup is called um, the E over M apparatus or the E over M um, experiment. If you notice, it consists of um, some very distinct components. Two coils and a tube, a vacuum tube. Now, I'll explain briefly um, what this experiment is all about. Shortly after the electron was discovered by our parents a long time ago, People wanted to know um, uh, more about this uh, uh, new charged particle, negatively charged particle, the electron. So they devised uh, various experiments, including this one here, to uh, be able to allow them to determine what the charge of the electron was and what the mass of the electron was. But they failed on both counts. Nevertheless, the people that performed this experiment, Thompson and his colleagues, they eventually got the Nobel Prize in Physics because they discovered something we never knew before. And that something is the ratio of the charge of the electron to the mass of the electron. Okay? To us, it may not seem um, uh, such a, a big thing now, but at that time, when we didn't know too much about um, electricity or particle physics, um, even the ratio of uh, this new uh, particle, the electron, uh, was an important big step in, uh, in, uh, in our understanding of uh, physics. Okay, let me first describe the Helmholtz coils. You will notice that there's two coils. The reason that there's two coils is this experiment um, needs a uniform magnetic field. Okay, a magnetic field where the magnetic field lines are uniform. They don't get stronger or weaker, it has to be uniform. And um, there was um, a young scientist named um, Helmholtz who was experimenting with coils. And um, when he used one coil and he passed the current through the coil, there was um, a circular magnetic field that's produced around the wires. Same with this other coil too. When a current passes through the coil, a uh, magnetic field, a uh, donut shaped, is produced around uh, this coil too. When he brought those two coils together, so they're very close, the two magnetic fields merge and they actually form not two donut uh, shaped magnetic fields, but one single sausage shaped magnetic field. And the magnetic field lines in the coils themselves, inside the circle of the coils, they were parallel and in the same direction. So inadvertently, what did he achieve? Uh, a uniform magnetic field. Now, in this setup, you will notice a glass tube. This glass tube will actually um, produce um, this beam of their electrons, uh, but beam of charged particles, which we're going to be studying today. Now, all charged particles do not give off light on their own. And they are also too small to see. So, in order to uh, be able uh, for us to see the beam of uh, moving charged particles, this vacuum tube is not a total vacuum. It has a little bit of uh, gas in it. Uh, uh, the gas that uh, is in this tube is helium. It's a very, um, uh, a very low pressure, a very rarefied gas. But it is important to have a little bit of gas present. Why? When this beam of moving charged particles rubs against um, the helium atoms, the helium atoms get excited. And um, because they get excited, they will give off light. And by the light that the helium atoms give off, we are uh, able to actually uh, follow the path of this invisible beam of uh, moving charged particles. 
So, um, I will not do the experiment as is described in your lab manual, but I will uh, show you some basic things uh, that you need to know. First of all, there is um, a master switch here. Let me turn these off first. There's a master switch. You turn it on. Okay. And um, there's a, a switch over here, um, which is for voltage across two plates in the vacuum tube. In this uh, vacuum tube, there's two plates. These plates are called the anode and the cathode. Because the power supply we're going to be applying is a DC voltage source, um, one of these plates, the anode, will be positive, and the other plate will be negative. Now, uh, whenever you turn on uh, the power to a vacuum tube, before the vacuum tube can work properly, it needs to be heated up. So if you look very carefully, there is uh, an orange glow at the cathode end. That orange glow is the heating element. Okay? It will allow us to easily strip electrons from the cathode end and accelerate them to the anode end. Okay, so now that we've given it about a minute to warm up, we crank up the voltage to about um, 250 or 300 volts. Okay, and um, without turning off the lights, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drape this uh, focusing cloth over the apparatus to increase uh, the contrast. And you should be able to see what looks like um, a greenish-blue lightsaber pointing to the left over here. And um, to make it a little bit easier to see, I'll remove this scale. Can you see the, uh, the greenish-blue beam of uh, light? Now, this is um, a, a beam of electrons, okay? And um, because we applied a voltage between the cathode and the anode, um, electrons are going to accelerate from the cathode to the anode. The anode, though, has a small little hole in it. So whatever electrons are not absorbed by the anode plate, the ones that manage to go through will be traveling at a constant velocity this time, not accelerating, but a constant velocity, because they no longer experience the accelerating force between the cathode and anode that we applied, that, that voltage. And um, um, they'll come out at a constant velocity. And like I said, because we have a little bit of helium gas in the gas tube, um, we can actually trace the path of the electron beam. Okay. Now, you are going to use um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a technique known as the right-hand rule for particle physics. It relates three important um, uh, formulas, uh, three important variables. Uh, the magnetic field that's present, the um, uh, velocity of the moving charged particles, and the force that these moving charged particles experience while moving in a magnetic field. And um, uh, I won't show you how to apply this right-hand rule, okay? Uh, your TA and myself will help you in the labs if you have any difficulties. But uh, I'll give you a quick demonstration to show you using a localized uh, magnetic field. This is a, a magnet with a south end and a north end. And if I bring one end of the magnets close to the beam, you'll notice that the beam is deflected. It's not attracted or repelled by magnetic field lines. It's deflected perpendicular to the magnetic field lines because um, the magnetic field at the north end of the magnet is coming out this way, is going this way. The beam velocity is going this way. And by applying the right-hand rule, and I'll quickly describe how you use it, um, you align the fingers in the direction of the, the beam, bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, which is this way, and the cross product of V cross B will give you a vector quantity F that is perpendicular to the plane of V cross B. So, since the right-hand rule for particle physics applies for positively charged particles, V cross B, if this was a beam of uh, positively charged particles, it must deflect in the direction of our thumb, downwards. But you'll notice that um, when I bring the north end of the magnet towards the beam, it's deflected upwards. So, as particle physicists who now know how to use the right-hand rule, the conclusion that we can make is that this mysterious blue-green beam 
must be a beam of negatively charged particles because it does not obey the right hand rule. And um, we have a compass, which you will also use in this experiment to trace the magnetic field lines. And I'll show you what happens to the compass when I apply a current in the Helmholtz coils, in these two coils. Okay. Um, notice that the compass is pointing now inside, uh, away from us. This red pointer is pointing now away from us. If I flip the direction of the current in the Helmholtz coils with this switch, you will notice now that that compass now is now pointing in the opposite direction. And if I move the compass anywhere inside the Helmholtz coils, you will notice that the, the field is uniform. Why? Because the direction of uh, the compass is always the same. But because a compass can be used to trace magnetic field lines, which are really closed loops, Look what happens when I move the compass from inside the, the Helmholtz coils to outside the Helmholtz coils. Did you notice how the direction of the magnetic field lines have changed? Why does this happen? Well, magnetic field lines, like I said, are closed loops. So when you have zillions of these magnetic field lines coming out, where do they want to eventually end up? wrap around and come back to where they started from. So that's about it in a nutshell for this uh, E over M experiment.